Hey, this is Brian with Concerts That Made Us podcast, and you're listening to Pods Like Us, a great show about other great shows. Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Corbell, known to my friends as Marv. And this time I am speaking with Amy from the show Call for Cats. Hey, Amy, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Marv. Appreciate it. It's, it's fine. It's great. You know, it's, um, it's nice to speak to somebody who's, uh, well, very new to the game, shall we say. Yes, in fact, this technology um, has made me more focused and appreciative of the people like yourself who are doing this and have been doing this for um, what seems like, it does seem like years, doesn't it? But um, yeah, there's so many podcasts that I listen to that I decided a nice way to get recognition and for me to circle back in my music career journalism wise would be to do this so that's um that's one of the impetuses for for uh getting this podcast up and running absolutely so will this actually be your first ever experience with doing podcasts then or have you been on other shows or, or anything yes this will be um me starting off um, wading into the waters um, metaphorically. I have been involved only as a guest, um, if you might want to say that, with certain other people who have either done presentations. Um, Some of them have actually been, uh, for instance, I did do uh, an interview video-wise for a Beatles um, sort of fest that was done vir- virtually earlier this year because it was the only way that it could be done. And that sort of whetted my appetite. And to have people that I know, including yourself and other colleagues doing this, I figured this might be a nice way for me to, like I was saying earlier, to come back, revisit Squeeze and 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 start off and, and see how everybody likes it. And I've actually been getting some very good feedback to be honest yeah um agreed i mean what i've what i've heard by from 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 squeeze particularly from uh, from chris and glenn is I, I can see where people would to a degree i've seen it on websites where they've said they were like the next lennon and mccartney in some ways you can sort of see that but in other ways you can't because i think there's a big difference between the two of them but I can see a natural how somebody who would love the Beatles would then be interested in the music of Squeeze. It's been a blessing and a curse that they have both acknowledged literally since the day they started. I would say probably with the release of an album of theirs uh, in 1981 called East Side Story, which we'll probably touch upon that cemented their reputation fairly early on and that's where the comparisons uh started with lennon and mccartney um they kind of were cursed with it in a bit because they certainly had very different upbringings um they were almost a a decade removed from the beatles 
And they certainly came along at a time that their particular style of songwriting and their particular songs really stood out. So I think that's probably where the comparisons uh, started back back in those days. Well, well, in a sense, they started a, a something with. Um, I mean, you had it to a degree with writers such as uh, Costello um, and others, where it was a different style of lyricism to it. Um, and then after that, you would find that there'd be people like the Divine Comedy. I think are very lyrically. They feel like they're inspired or influenced by the lyricism of uh, of Difford and Tilbrook. To me. And I would I would agree with anybody that would like to um, use uh, their songs as a sort of yardstick for um, being able to compose lyrics with melodies that appear to most people intelligent, but also strike a chord with a lot of people worldwide. And that's, I think, where the... Um, comparisons to Lennon and McCartney being pop, being accessible, um, writing great songs, delivering great instrumentation, uh, especially with Glenn Tilbrook, who is pretty much if everybody's a squeeze fan or follower, acknowledges his outstanding guitar abilities, um, something he doesn't really um, sort of you know, blow his own trumpet about. He's not really a George Harrison, no. but he's his own. He's he's Glenn Tilbrook. Yeah, and actually thinking even more about it, I was thinking earlier on about um, how even across across the pond in Canada, I, uh, when I think of um, bands like Bare Naked Ladies, I think of like One Week, and that reminds me of the lyricism and the, the melodic uh, brilliance of a song like Hourglass. Absolutely. There were um it's 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 interesting that you bring up bare naked ladies because um although they were for us here in the States extremely popular in the 90s, which is around the time that I was covering the music scene, we called it the alternative. And of course the kings of the hill for alternative at that time were REM. Absolutely. And yes. bare naked ladies were part of that. I don't want to use the word wave, but there were certainly many bands that were coming into the United States at that time. And this was interesting because Squeeze was almost, in many people's eyes at that time, say between 90 to 95, not, they were, they were sort of reaching their adulthood as far as that crowd. So bands like the Bare Naked Ladies were coming back up the hill, were coming up the hill. Uh, in that respect. So yes, all all great for those guys. So have you, have you been a fan of Squeeze from, from the beginning? I mean, I, I don't want to, I'm not sure whether to broach that question because it almost, it's almost like asking a person how old they are in a way, but have, have you been a, a fan of Squeeze for a long time? A long time would be be probably more truthful. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, the beginning of Squeeze would, again, speaking from a stateside point of view, started in 1981, which was a couple of years after what many in the UK would acknowledge as their true beginnings. Um, we were fortunate enough to have um, what is now considered iconic uh, uh, programming called music television, MTV. Yeah, MTV. Yeah. And which was launched in the summer of 1981. And the only things, the only videos that were pretty much available to be shown were bands from the UK who had either produced videos in the year before MTV launched and sometime in that time frame. Yeah. And Squeeze was fairly ubiquitous with uh, the release of Tempted. And I'm pretty sure that that in many ways helped to launch them and and keep them atop of the of the of the audience in the state the state side as well and so definitely that was where my sort of visual and MTV was visual started was around that time period it was around 1981 yeah well yeah because i mean the uh, british acts uh we, we had all, always been working with, well, we had been working with the music videos for a long while before that point because we had shows in the UK like Top of the Pops, um, 
and that sort of thing where music videos would be put on if bands were unable or artists were unable to actually perform on the show. So they made music videos. Initially, they were relatively cheap and they got more uh, expensive and had, had effects added to them. Or so we were already doing that anyway, whereas I think for American audiences, other than the odd acts like the Michael Jacksons with uh, you know songs from uh, Off the Wall, etc., it didn't seem to be such a big thing that music videos were a thing that were made. And I think weren't the uh, the Australians as well, they were making videos at that point as well. So I think you'd probably have things like, um, um, oh, um, no, not, I'm not thinking of Men at Work. I'm thinking of Split Ends and groups like that. I think Men at Work were a lot later than that. So I would guess that you'd have Split Ends on the MTV in America as well. Yes, absolutely. And and to your point, it was interesting that um, jogging my memory for all of those first um, videos that were played on MTV amongst Squeeze. Again, yes, there were a lot of those British bands who that kind of had been their their thing. That's what they did. And it, that included also people like um, Joe Jackson and a lot of people that we as as Americans had actually never heard of, which helped to break a lot of these bands like Squeeze, um, especially with people like uh, Thomas Dolby and Split Ends, again, who were played just, you know, to the umpteenth degree. Duran Duran. And and Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet um, starting to get into that. What Squeeze was officially or unofficially labeled as part of the new wave. And that's, again, my generation... Uh, who were part of that watching on the on the airs would call that w- would call all those people. I I interviewed many bands later on in the '90s who may have fit the bill back then, but they just were not functioning as bands back then. But also there were also other bands who actually helped to make it big, which not coincidentally that I thought about when I was going to start this podcast and I picked Squeeze. I said they've just finished up as of this talk a u.s tour with um and some dates they had with hall and oats okay and wow. hall and oats they had started the tour um early last year with hall and oats squeeze did played a couple of gigs and then everything ground to a halt in the springtime and then basically they restarted it up again this year and hall and oats found their footing and uh re-emergence heavily with mtv and some people could look at the two of them pairing together and go, what's going on there? Again, there's another sort of 10-year gap in age difference and audience. But nowadays, it's come full circle. And so we're able to watch people like Hollow Notes and Squeeze come together. Um, Squeeze is actually going to do a tour uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks for the fall in the UK with Madness. Wow. Yes, and of course. So, yeah. Everything's just sort of nostalgia uh, version 3.5, I guess, at this point. <laughs> a lot of artists are doing things like that, though, aren't they, where they will tour with similar bands from a similar era. era. So, yeah, I mean, uh, but it, it's, it's a strange one because with uh, with Squeeze, um, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to put them in again with, with Split Ends again, whereas they're not an ordinary band that... They've got this, uh, there's a certain eccentricity, shall we say, about the music that they produce in comparison to a lot of other bands from that time. Yeah, I think that in and of itself speaks to the songwriting. Um, a number of people could say, well, Squeeze is different in Tilbrook, and anybody else that plays with them has the good fortune to play with them. And that has happened. There have been many forms of Squeeze. There was also a form of Different in Tilbrook, which um, they did record an album in 1984, which if you want to call that a solo album, (laughs) um, in a time period that Squeeze semi broke up, that is considered the Lost Squeeze album. However, when as a person who is familiar with both sides of the coin, That album, while a collector would love to have it and enjoys listening to it, I consider that to be slightly more, and I use this term lovingly, self-indulgent. Something was a little missing, you know, something that I think 
that they both, Chris and Glenn, both acknowledged many years later. It's it's a little too busy in its in its words and and melody got a little complicated in there. Yeah. People love it, like they can love and hate anything about any type of music. Um, but that seemed to then turn around their fortunes after 1984. So it, it comes and goes in waves, like uh, like we've said. Yeah, but but the different variations, different versions of squeeze. They they have different sounds as well. Where I think that uh, the the Holland uh, Lavis period, where where you've got um, they they there's there's a lot of really staggered um, contrasting rhythms going on in those. Whereas if you compare that to the to the era when they had uh, Paul Carrick, there was more of a almost soulful uh, feel to to squeeze. I uh, totally agree on that point. I think everybody has a has a certain audience um, that they're sort of catering to when they come out and perform. Squeeze certainly fits the bill when uh, with uh, Jules Holland is a personality, to be perfectly yeah. honest, in my opinion. He's a personality. And if you've ever seen Squeeze with uh, Jules, which I had the pleasure of many years ago. Jules's uh, personality is extremely dominant, but he's also a fantastic piano player and has a very distinct style, which yeah. many people probably listening to this podcast would say he's a boogie woogie, as they call. It. He's got a very, you know, Louisiana down home, can just about do anything. His style is so recognizable. He actually um, contributed, if not too many people know this, to the fine young cannibal song, uh, Good Thing. That's his work yeah. in there. Yeah. And he yeah. also did uh, an extended uh, piece for The The, um, who, and the song is kind of escaping me, the song title at the moment. Oh, yes. Yep. I'm sure we'll think about it once we get off this podcast. <laughs> but um, then uh, Gilson came in. He was kind of like a sort of older adult figure past their original drummer, uh, who was, I, I'm going to do a little bit more research on him. His name is uh, Paul Gunn. Um, yes. Gilson, came, Gilson came in. Uh, Jules was already with Glenn about 74, 75. And so they were sort of uh, mates. Then that iteration of Squeeze pretty much took off. And then Jules left. And again, his personality just, I think, had to move beyond a band. And he became a presenter. That's that's the term you, uh, the the UK calls it, uh, a presenter for the tube. And he had his own show, and still continues actually to have his own show. Um, and he came in and came back uh, with Squeeze, and will have, there's a whole history behind that as well. Paul Carrick was asked to come in to the band in around 1981 and that's when they recorded east side story and that's i would guess if you tell me would you agree that that's pretty much their most well-known period beyond beyond the videos possibly although saying that i think call for cats is one of their most recognizable albums as well i would say yeah i would say that that's a very distinctive tune to from put that, it from the early era of them anyway yes yeah. To put it mildly, that's uh, that that has its has its charms. Uh, I remember a, a gig that I went to in the late eighties. Uh, Chris Difford, here he is, the lead singer of their one of their big hits, most recognizable because he has a very distinctive vocal delivery. Yeah. And he said, um, "I really, I'm just not that guy anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm not that <laughs> 20, 20 something guy. I don't know if I really feel comfortable performing that song." But having said that, he is. 60 going to be 67 years old in a couple of weeks and he can still sing that song so i think he's come to terms with it yeah and um so yeah i i agree with you that there are certain um there there are certain atmospheres that surround squeeze which is a good thing which is a good thing absolutely the, the song with the though was uh, uncertain smile by the way <gasps> Yes, there you go. thank I'll, you. I looked it up. <laughs> no problem. That that was that was going to be an earworm for me until I actually got off this interview and went to find it. Absolutely. I actually saw the the I saw the the um, many years ago, and I'm 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 a little unsure <laughs> if they actually performed that song because that song uh, 
heavens. Jules went on for like at least six or seven minutes. That was like his own personal Hey Jude or something. I'm not quite sure, but that was that was quite a bit of him in that song. He was practically that song. Absolutely. Definitely. Hello, everybody. This is Ryan. This is Avery. And we are from the Frame by Frame King Crimson podcast. And you are listening to Pods Like Us. It, it, it was, it's interesting when they got to Paul Carrick because then they had, uh, I mean, Jules has sung with Squeeze, but with Paul Carrick, they had a, they had a recognisable uh, third, vo- third voice there that they could take advantage of in a way and use. And they absolutely 1000% Uh, were able to ride that, in quotations, new wave for them back then, because uh, even though uh, Paul had a minor hit with, uh, his band was called Ace, I believe, How Long? Yeah. Uh, Earlier, this iteration of Squeeze with Paul taking the lead is is quite... uh, it's it's quite fascinating to look at, especially when you're looking at the video. If anybody goes back and, and looks at it on YouTube, um, you see kind of Chris and Glenn taking a back seat, and even John Bentley, who was their bass player at the time, stepping up. The most uh, humorous situation is that the backing vocals for that song are actually Elvis Costello and Paul Young. <laughs> Wow, which Paul Young is that? Is the that the wherever I lay my hat? Is it that Paul Young? Because this there are two Paul Youngs. Yes, not not the uh, that Paul Young. Yes, not, yeah, not the, the one, one who from, actually not had the a hit singer, with not the lad singer from Sad Cafe then. And uh, no, no, this yeah. is the Paul Young who actually had a hit with another song by Daryl Hall. <laughs> yes, that's true. It all circles back, Martin, doesn't it? It does. It, it all comes back. <laughs> but, but, but when you said Paul Young, I was starting to think that would have been really strange if it had been Paul Young from Sad Cafe, because Paul Young from Sad Cafe and Paul Carrick w- went on to become the lead singers of Mike and the Mechanics. Right. You are so right. See, again, it all circles back. I actually, and I have so many stories, but I actually did meet Paul Carrick uh, with Adam Mike and the Mechanics show yeah. and asked Paul at the time, did he have any messages? Because I was uh, going to a show the, set, the next night. This is again in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I was going to go see uh, Elvis, uh, who was doing his, I guess you want to call it back then, it would have been the uh, stripped back acoustic uh, tour. What did MDV call those? Unplugged. Yeah. Um, he had had Spike come out. He was touring with Nick Lowe. Um, and Nick, if you're listening, uh, the invitation is open for uh, coming on to the Cool for Cats podcast. Because yes. I've met Nick and he, he's just, he's a such such a wit. And I asked Paul, is there any kind of message that you would like me to give to Elvis and Nick? And Paul said to me, tell him he owes me a dollar. <laughs> I I didn't go any further with it, but happily I was able to deliver that news to to, uh, to Nick the next night. <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. So um, yeah. you, you don't have a specific era then that you prefer out of the, out of those eras where, because I mean, Holland and Carrick have come and gone from squeeze over the years. They've, they've gone, then they've come back and then they've gone. And it, it's an interesting um almost like sliding door that's going on there and i would say that that's any time you pick any squeeze error like you said um people can focus on you know is it the holland era is it the carrick era um because paul did come back um around 1992 and did some fantastic place for uh the release in 1993 so those were some very poignant um, period. That was about a, a very poignant period for Squeeze uh, to be having Paul back in, to be honest. Yeah. And um, so I thought that, I, th- I, th- I think that any era is, is, is good. It, it really all depends. There's a lot of 
um, as I noticed um, at the gig that I went to, which was in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, it was a standalone gig, their gig, and they can play almost any song from any era and everybody will recognize it, which is fan- which is fantastic. And they can play something up into their last release, which I believe was 2017. I believe that was yep. the knowledge. Yep. Um, they can play that and people will respond to it. They're, they're going to definitely respond to early squeeze more so because of that sort of danceability. And it's um, the, the, the people that are currently in their band are contributing a lot of pep to the, to the beat. So I think any era is a good era. Jules Holland, Paul Carrick, uh, Andy Metcalf came in yeah. and played some keyboards, second keyboards with them. Andy was a member um, and still a contributing member. He possibly might be with Robin Hitchcock. Hey, there's another squeeze connection. Yes. Um, <laughs> Matt Irving, uh, who also contributed keyboards. I believe Matt passed away a number of years ago. Um, so there's there's been plenty of keyboard players who have brought their style to to squeeze. But yep. Um, yep. yes, long live Jules Holland. Yep, and and Jules's uh, brother as well, Chris. Yes, I I was reading about that um, that Chris came in and played some type of keyboards with them. I don't know too much details about that. I would love to have seen those kind of gigs, but I I have seen. Uh, Chris on video uh, playing um, with Jules. Yeah, and he he also from what what I was because I did, I did I did a bit of research earlier on, and he is also another one who with that revolving door thing. He's come and gone through the years as well. Every now and again, as a he, he usually works as like an extra keyboardist on top of the main keyboard player because a lot of the records from Squeeze, especially back in Jules. Uh, time they would uh, feature Jules doing multi-tracking you see it have more than one keyboard part which he couldn't actually do live so we get Chris to come in and do do one the one that he couldn't do live and it was it's it's an interesting contrast to think about Jules as sort of that um, analog version of piano where he's so prominently featured, um, I would I would venture to guess that if you look at his styles from RG Bargy and Another Nail in My Heart to the work that almost all of the work that he did on Cosi Fan Tutti Frutti, yeah. he did um, so much synthesizer work as well. And so that's a kind of a nice bridge, a kind of, you know, not to think about Squeeze as this, you know, pub band from Deptford, to uh, a band that has very highly stylized. But again, those bands that came back or were performing or producing material at that time have a certain distinct, that that, that era has a certain distinct sound, um, which may or may not be pleasing to people. They Some people are just loathsome of, of the 1985 squeeze. It just doesn't sound like anything that they remember. But... Mm looking at that time period you have to remember what was hit what was working for people and that's the style that they went to hey there this is bobby with the rock guys podcast and you are listening to marv smooth on the pods like us podcast check him out yeah and uh, being in this country i don't know how much how much of jules as uh, television show that you've seen over there but I always find it fascinating when he will be on show on his show. He will have, um, I mean, I've actually seen him on his own show performing with Paul Carrick when Paul Carrick's come on as a guest, which is fascinating because you'll have like Paul Carrick. I think I saw once where Paul Carrick was playing just an organ and singing and then Jules was, was backing him on the piano. And and you've also had both uh, Chris and Glenn on Jules's show as well, which, but then saying that you've also got the funny moment there. I've just realized you've, you've got Gilson playing the drums then behind Chris and Glenn on that show or behind Paul Carrick on that show. It's fascinating to see that. It, it is because I, now that you're talking about it and I, and I, and I had been thinking about it earlier, I think maybe most people look at these forms of squeeze and say okay well this this person was kicked out of the band because they did xyz and they're and that's they're not welcome back or they won't fit in anymore you know you know 
And to me, I think that's another great thing about the Squeeze universe and why you can keep going back to them and why there is so much history is that there doesn't appear to be that, um, for lack of a better word, animosity or um, disappointment. It's no, these guys are... Uh, musicians. They love playing. Anything that they can contribute, especially to compositions from Chris and Glenn, seem to be welcome. I know that Gilson, after he sort of stopped working full-time with Squeeze, he moved on and has pretty much, if you um, if you uh, know about it or can fill in the blanks, he's been really working with Jules on his big band, if, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, yeah, and they do a lot of work, that, that big band do. Uh, right, and I know that that's been, you know, as as I understand, you know, Gilson came in, came in as sort of like the adult <laughs> to early squeeze and, and had a lot of gigs and uh, performed with a lot of per- professionals mm-hmm. under his belt and that was and that was most welcome and he's just such a great drummer uh, anyway again all of these people who if uh, you know you, when you're listening to this podcast when you're listening to this podcast don't know about need to go back and and to appreciate all of the the hard work that's gone into this band that they haven't given up is 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 pretty much the the best thing about it that we can both I think we can both agree upon absolutely most definitely, yeah. So, um, actually, we will go, we'll go, we'll go to this uh, go to this side side subject as well. That when when I was thinking about it, and I wondered I wondered what you know about uh, work that they've done with Amy Mann and with Amy's husband, uh, Michael Penn. You know, I've only read a little bit, and this is the good thing about me doing a podcast is to be able to do more research into um, these kind of offshoot collaborations that I've only read about, but just sort of happened to be able to drop into the laps of squeezedom. Um, I know Amy Mann and I know her um, husband, but of course, Amy Mann is legendary in the Boston music circles. Absolutely. She was in, in a band called Till Tuesday. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to go back in and just sort of jump in the deep end and, and find out more. I I understand. Um, I think you could probably speak to it since you have brought it up about Amy's collaboration. She came in and and sang with them for a bit. She did. She sang and played guitar for them for a bit. And that was on stage. I don't know whether she performed, did she perform anything on any of the studio albums or was it just uh, touring that she was an extra voice and guitar. I I think at this stage of me talking to you at this moment, I'm going to lean on touring. Um, I'd have to go back and see if she contributed anything else um, to a, re- uh, a record session, either on her own or with collaborations. It's that's what I mean. It's so hard. It it's um, they're everywhere, <laughs> and you don't even know it no. <laughs> to be putting I mean, it bluntly. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do know that that they have both uh, collaborated with with Amy on her albums before. Now, I think uh, they're both on um, they're both on ba- the Bachelor album and the Lost in Space album. I know that for sure, um, and I also know that they're both on. Oh, I think it's. Uh, Michael Penn, MP4, it might be the album after that, Mr. Hollywood, but I think they're on there as well. At, at, at least um, uh, at least Chris is on, on there, at least. But, yeah, like you said, I mean, even the Amy Mann thing there, that's reminded me that she's had uh, Elvis Costello work with her on her albums as well. So, you know, you, you're going back to that link again, you know, where Costello's worked with them and with Amy, and there's like this... this little clique that the the click that they're all in yeah and i was speaking earlier to to robin hitchcock um who your listeners may or may not know again he had a very much more distinctive slant in his outlook which was um 
sometimes for some people it would have been a little bit hard to follow because he was he was very um he's very he was at the time very opinionated but also was very quirky but shared a lot in common with squeeze uh glenn sang with him um i think it was 91 on a song called uh, Beetle Dennis, Flesh Number One. Yeah. Oh, let's circle back again, Martin, <laughs> to that. Um, shared Andy Metcalf, uh, Andy having played with Robin. So there's a lot of people, um, and Elvis. Elvis just was actually going to, um, you might pretty well know that Elvis was thrown about in terms of working as a producer on East Side Story, the 1981 Squeeze album, which at the time was going to be looked at more as a double album. Okay. And they had enlisted uh, or had hoped to enlist not only Elvis, but Paul McCartney, uh, Nick Lowe, who we spoke about earlier, and Dave Edmonds and Dave and Nick yes. were in a band called Rock Pile. And their own, um, they had a composition, I believe, and I have to think about it again, going back in the midst of time and being an old person, thinking that they did a song that was a squeeze song, but they really racked it up on the tachometer. It, it could have been going either way, but I, I do know for sure that all of these threads from that time period are so intertwined. And by the way, that never happened. <laughs> East Side Story ended up just being one album, and it was mostly yeah. done by Squeeze and Roger, um, uh, his last name, Bicharam, I think his name is, he's still active. But yeah, that would have been a great thing. Everybody looks at that and goes, oh, if only. If only, absolutely. Um, but um, I was going to go to that. So, so anyway, now you have this knowledge. Um, so what, uh, from your own podcast listening, uh, how do you see yourself going forward then with, um, with making your show? Have you got, have you got an idea for what, it, what it's going to be all about and the, the structure and, and how each episode, uh, is going to move and go from one to another? At this point, talking to you, it gives me ideas. I feel sometimes that with the thing that you're very passionate about, a subject matter, you tend to um, operate in a vacuum and hope that what you talk about, the subjects that you talk about, uh, whether they be chronological or theme-oriented or guest-oriented that everybody else will listen to and hope that they enjoy it as well. When I first thought about this, I thought it might just be me, um, you know, nattering on about how fantastic, uh, you know, Babylon and on is, or yeah. let's listen to that instrumental off of Frank called Frank's bag, which is, you need to go listen because it's quite hysterical. Um, or is it going to be a situation that I could either help people who may have something to uh, talk about or reminisce about with their connections with Squeeze because you feel that with a band like this who has a decades-long history, there's got to be a lot to talk about. And, and having now put the word out to everybody saying, this is what my intention is. I'm going to talk about this, but I'd also like feedback as well. What would you like to hear so that I am not stuck in a vacuum um, you know, just chattering on about how much, you know, I love, I won't ever go drinking again from Kazi Fan Tutti Frutti. <laughs> I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're from the Spy Hards podcast. That's right. And you are listening to Pods Like Us, the podcast that also has the Midas touch. So, but I mean, it would probably be helped by the fact that you've got these um, co connections, shall we say, because you've already mentioned about uh, speaking with uh, Paul Carrick and with Nick Lowe. Um, so, I mean, how, how did you get those connections? I mean, you know, if, if it's not too much to ask, I mean, do, do you work actually in an industry that allows you to talk to these people or are you just a fan who happens to be incredibly lucky and to have spoken to these incredible people? It's a little smattering of both. However, I became, I've, I've had a creative background um, 
most of my life, you know, drawing and, and being an artist and a graphic designer. I decided, though, that around 1990, I really wanted to focus on music and was very, very lucky and fortunate to have a regional publication in New England at the time that was able to help me sort of foster that uh, music journalist uh, avenue. Yeah. So with that type of connection, most certainly I was able to have these meetings and, you know, the, the whole journalist kind of access backstage. I've actually met Chris and Glenn. I have interviewed Chris and Glenn and met them and been privy to other sorts of meetings that may or may not have had any relevance at the time, but I'm just now starting to remember so many years later. Um, but then life intervenes, you get involved in other things. And like I said, for now, I'm reaching out to people. You reached out to me as soon as I said squeeze and my intentions for bringing this into the podcasting world. I did a sort of a very quick search on podcasts and I search for squeeze and things come up that have nothing to do with this band called squeeze. <laughs> so many different categories of, of nothing involved with music. So I am writing at the moment um, and a contributing writer for um, Beatles books. My Beatles freak reviews have sort of reintroduced me to being, Hey, I'm really interested in promoting. I'm really interested in helping. I'm really interested in talking about things that people may or may not want to put out there and reminisce when it comes to their passions for music. And so with Squeeze, that's exactly what I have found. People reached back to me. It hasn't almost, it, it really hasn't even been a week since you and I are talking right now. And people have gone crazy. I mean, they, they're saying, I'm, I'm in, uh, just let me know. Um, let's have a talk. Let's have a chat. I've, you know, meaning somebody else has said, um, I've, I've interviewed Chris and Glenn, people who have attended the shows that they did this past couple of months, everything was positive. So that's where it all seems to come together. I'm just reaching out and people are literally raising their hands saying, when this is a go, I'm there. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. We'll come back to the podcast listening in a moment, but it's an interesting one because you've picked a subject where you, you're right. There's nothing out there and it's perfect for the podcasting world because I've, I've always said that the difference between podcasts and radio shows is that podcasts catch a specific niche audience that aren't catered for uh, generally, uh, especially by co commercial radio. Um, so you, you've picked a subject where it is a specific audience, but it's an audience that are hungry for that sort of thing so you've 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 picked on to picked a really good thing there i mean beatles ones as, as we both know because we we both listen to so many of them that they took the to a penny there's so many of those but you've picked a knee a niche subject where it sort of needs to be done and then but then from from a, they've got people who no matter what i mean especially in the uk you, you will find people who you mentioned the band squeeze and someone will always know a song from Squeeze that, for the most part, most people love. You know, you'll you'll say to someone, "Oh, Squeeze," and they go, "Tempted," or "Cool for Cats," or "Hourglass," or you can just reel the songs off. Uh, so they've got that sort of audience where it's not a manic audience like the Beatles or Queen or somebody like that, but it's it's a um, dare I say, friendly audience who just like, yeah, I like that, you know, where, but then at the same time as well, they were also inspirational to a lot of musicians over the year as well. So you'll find top musicians, you know, like, like Amy, like Michael, like even Elvis Costello. He's, he's a fan of, of uh, Glenn and Chris and they're, a, they're a fan of Elvis. So, and, you know, Paul McCartney loves, loves, the songs of, of Glenn and Chris as well. So people love them, but they're not that sort of mania, shall we say. 
Yeah, I agree on that because like um, you, I agree 1000% that there is much to still at this point dissect about the Beatles. And as we're speaking, um, another teaser for that uh, six hour documentary. How many hours is it now? 12,000 or six? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and everybody just went nuclear today as, as we're talking about this little trailer, because it's so, um, de- it's so entrancing. It's, it's, it, it just reels you in. And with squeeze, it can tend to be more of just a, um, as you and I are talking more of a casual conversation almost it's not that either one of us have to sort of sit and think a moment about what we like and don't like about squeeze um you know what issues have we had or what haven't we heard there there is a that i would say more of but most of it most of it is focusing on the positive and the fact that there hasn't been let's say a deep dive archaeologically speaking, like there was and is with the Beatles, um, we really only have two two books, if you want to call it that. We have Chris Difford's autobiography that was published in 2017, and we also have uh, a book called Squeeze Play by Play, which uh, Chris and Glenn contributed heavily to. Uh, why wouldn't they? Because they were the songwriters uh, with uh, Jim Drury, who, if Jim, if you're listening to this, you are also invited onto a future podcast for Cool for Cats. And I appreciate the fact that, like I said, it's it's more of a, a all all uh, encompassing, all invite. Um, audience who just really enjoys and to a degree cannot believe that these guys are still going and producing high quality material, collaborate with people you don't know about or maybe do know about. And it, it brings a smile to everybody's face. And I think that's where a lot of people who have responded back to me about this have said this band is the soundtrack of my life or i've been following this band since 1975 you know in a in a pub in deptford um which is basically their stomping ground which is just south of london and i i really truly appreciate that i'm i'm looking forward to hearing people's stories i'm hearing a, a lot of like i said very very good feedback i'll probably take almost anything in and we'll turn it around and and put it back out in any form you were asking earlier what where do i see the podcast going and at this point it just seems like it can go anywhere it can um i, I don't know why i've just thought of this but what what is your rapport like with uh, with Chris and Glenn? It is at this stage in 2021 very very far removed. I okay. interviewed uh, Chris back around the time that Babylon and On the album came out, and they were in the middle of a U.S. tour, wow. and I was able to interview him on the phone back in the day for a publication I was working for at the time. Um, And again, this was in the Boston area that I was able to, um, when they actually came and played to go backstage and meet them. And for Glenn, I spoke to him at the release of Some Fantastic Place, which was 1993. And it was a very interesting time for him. I could kind of hear it in his voice. I didn't meet him at the time. and I could hear it in his voice that I think this is an album that also deserves a deep delve that is now just being sort of talked about. His his teenage sweetheart had um, the previous year passed away from cancer, and he was in the midst of either a separation or divorce from his first wife, and she had uh, moved to Australia. And he was not seeing his his two children at that time uh, quite as often as he would like to have. So there's a lot of feeling that gets missed, I think, a lot in regards to um, their music. And, and, uh, and even if you have something that affects you personally, like these, these events did with them, um, you can look back and understand. And hopefully, like I say, with this podcast, we can get a better understanding 
not just because Chris is the lyricist and is writing everything autobiographically. He he may or may not, but with uh, uh, a lot of the feedback I'm getting for people who want to know more about the analysis or if you want to know about the gear, certainly that's stuff that at this juncture with a podcast and now with my years going, being able to go back, relive and, re- and I'm like, oh yes, that is something that I would like to have talked about or understood and not just have Chris tell me down the phone, you know, long distance that he, he really hated the black coffee in bed video. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really that didn't really make me feel good you know at the time so, he's not alone there's a lot of there's a lot of musicians who don't like videos that they've made yeah especially at that time it was definitely for the mtv eyes and the director of that video um his name is steve Barron. Okay. let's circle back again martin because he directed michael jackson's billy jean <laughs> is, is he the chap who did um Aha's take on me video. Is that Steve? Gonna, yes, it is. Yeah. I would I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, it so, is. Yep. Yeah. Chris just has said, I, I don't remember his exact words to me, but I've even read variations that he's talked about through the years that it just they just did not even feel they were part of their own video <laughs> when they made that. So it's hard because it's a very it's a very iconic song for them. Um, people of my generation will associate it with that video. But now with this distance, we can look at it and uh, <clears throat> laugh. Yes, we can. The, the reason why I asked about the relationship is because I had this ridiculous pie-in-the-sky idea that that, that might have worked, but I, I don't know how likely it would be that you could get this to work. So. Every now and again, when you're discussing a subject, like if you do a specific episode on an album or where you're talking to somebody who, who knows Chris or Glenn, you could basically possibly get them to just record for you a single memory to do with that subject. And then you have that included in an episode. Yeah, that's exactly where a lot of this feedback is coming from people that I may not be intimately familiar with, even on a name recognition basis, whose work I may be sort of um, familiar with, you know, as sort of third party removed situation. So many of those people are readily available. um, And it's, um, it's great that you are saying that because that is where a lot of this, um, correspondence that's happening uh, via email and chats and messages and so forth and so on. Um, Somehow, like I said, I've touched a nerve and why this is sort of exploded so quickly. I I literally do not know how that's happened because I do feel that there are people that have been in Squeeze's orbit have either left it um, or are continuing on with their careers in either production or song, musicians, however, and they need to be brought back and and they need to be given recognition nowadays, you know, in, and not to sound like too down or anything, but, you know, before it's too late, you know, because they've been with the band or did a lot for the band that, that may not have been able to at that time given recognition for you're you're not concerning yourself with the people that supported them um back in the early 70s unless they themselves have said something or an interviewer has asked them specifically about it this is not a band like the beatles where literally you feel every waking and sleeping moment has been documented Um, that you can go back and reference to. So that's what I'm looking forward to is hopefully being able to bring back either some people that I need to feel their story is very important to the Squeeze universe and also to the fans to make sure that, you know, some of them are in their 20s. I wouldn't say that the show that I attended and what I could see from online I know I'm not speaking explicitly to a bunch of teenagers or 20-somethings, but I will say that a lot of people from what I read attended a lot of these shows for the first time, and they may have been um, going retro 
almost at this point, going vintage with remembering bands back from Squeeze's time period. And certainly East Side Story, unbelievably, is 40 years old this year. And I'm not, again, not to put too fine a point on it, that that's an album that is definitely recognizable and certainly deserves recognition. So I'm hoping that, as I was saying earlier, Nick, hello, if you're listening to this, we met in a pub in London in 1990. If you're available, I'm available. Let's go. <laughs> Let's hope he's listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is Dave of Live Life Loud, the Decibolic Podcast, and you're listening to Pods Like Us with Marv. 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 So what sort of podcast do you listen to then? And uh, were, were, are there a specific podcast that you uh, are inspired by to, you know, basically base almost your your own show around that sort of structure that they use? I will say that, no word of a lie, most of the podcasts are Beatles-centric because that's where basically everything's with me on that but um a lot of that takes up time and you really have to be have an ear tuned to what you feel is the best um either it's personalities for me it can be personalities sometimes object matter that brings me in i will say that there's a there's quite a few out there um one thing that was very inspirational to me was that Chris Difford started his own podcast not too long ago, and his podcast is charity-driven with an organization that he is collaborating with called Help Musicians, which is based in the UK. So he can call on friends and, and fellow musicians and have a sit down and chat about their careers. Some of it's mostly UK centric that I don't know if a lot of stateside listeners will be familiar with, but his first guest was Sting. Um, yep. So you can't lose there. And Chris has a very sort of warm voice. Um, I always have joked that he should go into YouTube channel with this thing called ASMR, you know, where people talk like this and they're very soothing and he could put you to sleep in 10 seconds. So I, I think Chris will have a great career after squeeze doing that. Um, also trying to find more women centric podcasts as well is a great, thing that has also inspired me. Um, I have a woman who is based in Ireland and she does a podcast on the Bee Gees called Gibology. Yep. And when I heard her and she had come into my orbit through uh, Be the Beatles and starting a group of women centric um, group on Facebook where we are academic based and people who would also remember the Beatles and actually were first-generation Beatles, that whole sphere has also expanded to women in who are now basically having PhDs and masters in pop culture, which is really, really exciting. And so I figured I could step into this, pick a band that I really feel needs to have a lot of recognition and also be able to make it very audience uh, friendly, either side of the Atlantic. Here you are in the UK, I'm here in the United States, and we're talking about squeeze like it's secondhand nature. So those are the things I'm hoping that come across when uh, when this really gets going, which it already seems to be. Yeah, wow, well, it, it does seem to be. Yeah, because um, you, you said to me earlier on that you, you seem to be wanting to go for it sooner than you were initially going to it seems to be something that you just want you've got that urge now originally you had the idea but now you've actually got that urge to just get going with it almost absolutely because i had no idea you can only go to say a show or a gig that has squeeze and you would understand obviously the people around you enjoy this band. They enjoy the performance. They're singing along. They know the songs. Um, and then you get into the realm of me just reaching out to the people that 
I consider, you know, friends on the internet or friends on the web that share the squeeze interest. And it really did amaze me. It's, it's nothing like how I remember literally back in the days of uh, calling people up and having it. I guess what it is, is it's, it's a more direct connection for me. And I know a lot of people who have been doing music journalism for a long time and giving press to a lot of people, the, the environment has changed so much. And that's what I appreciate is that people will reach back out to me who may have been either doing this for 40 years. And I've just have just put that out there and said, I'm going to do this. And what do you think? And let's hear some feedback. And like, uh, you you reached out and people just some spark went off in people's heads. So that's what I'm really, really, really happy about. So I, I guess I got to get on this thing because Lord knows it's 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 taken me off into an avenue. I certainly did not expect to be going, you know, 65 miles an hour <laughs> on the freeway with this in less than a week. So I'm I'm really happy, but I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Just make sure that you're prepared before you start doing it, though, so that you you know you've got your equipment ready and you you sort of know what what you where you're going to go to with, with, with the show how it's going going to be. Just make sure that you've got that in place first. Yes, fortunately, I have the equipment needed, so that's that was thing that was actually something that I was actually in sort of been doing the last couple of months is is building into that the hardware and the software. And it's really funny that the subject matter has come later. Most people will think, I want to do a podcast on chopping wood. And they'll write out their history and outline and bullet points and go find the subject matter experts. And then they'll have to start thinking about, hmm, what kind of microphone do I need? And what kind of software? And what platform am I going to host this thing on? And I have always liked technology. And I've always been interested in it. And the feedback I'm also getting from people who have podcasts um, has been extremely helpful, too. It's a very giving atmosphere and a very welcoming um, atmosphere for people who are already and have been doing it as far as that's concerned. And for me, it's been reaching back and understanding that I need to do this and I need to do that. And wow, this person really wants to talk to me in three days. I better, you know, hop on the horse and get going here. (laughs) And actually, I've got a funny story, not not sort of going with this, but in a way that's similar to that where when DVD players first came out, I actually think I owned three or four DVDs before I even had a DVD player to play them on. Because I thought, you know, well, I'm going to get one at some point. I might as well make sure that I've got something to watch when I buy one. <laughs> No, you you were like you were like my brother from another mother because that's exactly what happened when we got involved when my husband and I got involved with that technology we we bought like a few DVDs when they first came out because he was into laser discs and you know videotape and then all of a sudden this new technology comes out and we're like well let's let's pick up some titles first <laughs> and then when the machine's available for us uh, affordably we'll purchase it and and that's exactly what we did. So so we're definitely on the cutting edge. There's there's so many options. I feel like we're aren't we like decades removed from Bruce Springsteen's, you know, was it 56 or 57 channel and nothing on? It's just incredible. This, you yes. know, that we're that we're even talking and doing this. Um, and that you're gonna be able to just send out a bunch of ones and zeros, and all of a sudden people are gonna know about something that you know you had to hire a press agent and put out a PR release and write this up. And and I did all a lot of that too when I was working with local bands in Boston. You know, I'd be very, very helpful to them and talk about their gigs and what club they're gonna play at and which radios, you know, which college radio station they're gonna have, you know, a guest spot on. So that was a lot of hard work back then. And it was a lot of hard work getting squeeze um noticed and all a lot of those um young bands, you know, as uh, the manager and this is spinal tap said about Boston, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not it's not a big college town. So, um, but it is, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work that goes on in the background. That's why I'm very appreciative that, um, this technology exists. And, and of course, I'm extremely appreciative that people are taking an interest, uh, yourself included. Absolutely. I'm really interested in it. So 
have you got an idea for the show music yet or any effects that you might use in the show? Have you been looking for those as well? I've been thinking and talking and talking and thinking. And um, but yes, I'm I'm looking forward to at this time probably going to be using some genre that reminds you of squeeze at, at this point. I think it's might be best not to totally associate it with any one song, even though I've picked a title for the podcast. And I, I did think about that because yeah. I know that that's a very, um, it hits a chord with a lot of people, whereas some other songs that people might like, or, you know, were a hit, um, that particular, those three words really are associated with squeeze. Um, any time after that will probably just be an evolution of whatever happens next. I'm got my own graphic design hat on. I have a younger daughter who is just so talented and will be doing some artwork for me that will be associated with the podcast. So that is something that's again ongoing. But I've been telling her, hey, I gotta get this thing going. Yes. <laughs> so just- just don't get her to do a recreation of the album cover. Yeah, we got to have what a, I have like the home studio. So I, I need to have a, a local regional band from Central Florida that likes Squeeze. We're going to have to have you come in and, and do a recording, recreating, uh, let's see, side one of the debut album. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just do something that's got like... Um got a rhythm that's similar to the call for cats song but not actually call for cats yeah i think it's probably going to have to have some sort of chugging backbeat uh to it you know definitely some guitar slash uh effects that go on it because Glenn's got, of course, this, you know, if you're familiar with the Cool for Cats song, he's got this crazy middle uh, portion solo that goes up and down. It's got this phasing, really crazy stuff from, you know, from the late 70s going on in there. So I may I may be searching for for something like that. So it's it's recognizable, but kind of makes you think. Hey, this is Jack from Bad Counsel. You want some good counsel? Keep listening to my man Marv and Pods Like Us. Absolutely. So, um, well, you mentioned the title. We've gone through quite a lot. So what other podcasts do you actually listen to then, Amy? They, again, are Beatles-centric. Um, one of the top ones who I've also um fully fully um recommend is a podcast called something about the beatles it's hosted by robert rodriguez and he is from chicago that's not a strong endorsement for chicago but it's a heck of an endorsement robert is is thorough he's really really i mean he deep dives he goes he goes eight miles down for the beatles and so i've appreciated his work a lot um, there's also a podcast, another Beatles podcast that's called uh, The Beatles Naked, yep. and it's hosted by Richard Buskin and Eric Taros. I love the two of them interacting. Richard, of course, is British, but he's also in Chicago, and Eric is uh, in the Massachusetts area, but he's done a lot of work. He did work on the Eight Days a Week documentary with Ron Howard. And he's a restoration expert. So those two podcasts, I I highly recommend. There's a lot of women-centric podcasts also that are Beatles-oriented. Diana Erickson uh, is part of a podcast called One Sweet Dream that really goes over, above, and beyond um, just the normal Beatles discussions uh, interpersonality-wise. And so I highly recommend uh, hers. I also enjoy uh, Chris Shaw, who hosts a Beatles podcast called I Am the Egg Pod. Yes. Uh, Chris's voice is just totally amazing. I, I, I love his voice. He could host any podcast. I would listen to it. And I also enjoy uh, a podcast called Nothing is Real. 
Yeah. That's uh, Jason Cardi and Stephen Cockcroft. They're in Ireland. They're in Dublin and in Belfast, live on tape, as they usually like to say. <laughs> so those are those are some of my uh, top ones at the moment. I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, my inspiration uh, is a woman yeah. who hosts Gibology. It's a PG's podcast, and it's hosted by Sarah. And all of these podcasts, I believe, are pretty much available on all the podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, just name it, go search it, and you'll find it. Okay. So what? I, I, I know this is the first time that you're, you're starting your own podcast, but have you actually got any adv- advice for people about starting their own podcast? It is, like you said, a lot of it to do with the hard and, hardware and software to be honest, um, I feel that a lot of people, if I express my passion about a subject, I think that they understand that, you know, you're the person and anybody that you'd like to bring in, that's that's totally cool as far as that's concerned. I, I'm hoping that a lot of what I've been doing with the Beatles, uh, the work that I did with Robert Rodriguez for his um, his sort of, he called it the Fab Four Con Jam, which was a two-day virtual fest. And I was, I was able to do a video interview. It kind of all comes back to me. And it's something that I do actually enjoy doing, speaking and interviewing and finding out and researching and trying to be that sort of, you know, deep dive rabbit hole that you cannot get out of kind of person when it comes to the, when it comes to squeeze, I'm, I'm hoping of that. But I know that there are a lot of people out there the subject matter is near and dear to their hearts. So for me, it's going to be uh, an evolution down a roadway with how I choose to present myself, how the subject matter, where it tends to go, what's most popular, getting feedback from everybody. How does it sound? You know, um, and and I found you here and what are you doing there? And so I feel that a lot of it will probably end up being me learning a lot about how to actually put the mechanics of a podcast together. I think that the subject matter, I'm crossing my fingers, but it looks like and it sounds like that will take care of itself. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's a lot of areas you can go into, that's for sure. I mean, and guests as well. Because like I said, you know, you, you you can throw a stone in water and so many ripples will come off of musicians and artists who've been inspired by them. That's that's for sure. And I'm hoping, and I don't think it's being too facetious to say that, you know, a lot of people would like to have the dream guest or guests on who possibly have a very tight rain on the subject matter itself so of course the two people to um to hopefully have on would be chris and glenn um glenn looks like a possibility it looks like he may be coming back to the u.s for some solo dates and if that's the case then i most certainly will um be getting him in front of a microphone and talking about you know, his gig, if and when that happens. Um, And, you know, as soon as that happens, I will definitely let everybody know it'll not be a trade secret. That's for sure. (laughs) Definitely not. So um, do do you know yet where people can, uh, will be able to find the show? And is there a way you've set up already for people to contact you? Yeah, I've actually got a few things. Thank you for mentioning the contact information. Where can you find me? Um, As of this moment, I have an email account that is set up specifically for people to contact me about anything to do with Squeeze. Um, As I said, I put out word for gear and gigs and bios and books and all sorts of media content. So I'm, I'm extremely open to that. It is cool for cats podcast one word at gmail.com i'm also on facebook this podcast has its own facebook page right now it doesn't have a unique username but you can go into facebook and search cool for cats a squeeze podcast that's me i'm also on instagram with the handle at cool for cats pod and twitter same handle at cool for cats pod. And I'm hoping I get, I'm getting a lot of good feedback through some Facebook groups 
that I've joined that have to do with Squeeze. So if you're in a Facebook group and you're hearing my voice, most certainly friend me. I'm Amy McGrath Hughes. We can start to message or drop me a line, Gmail, the Gmail account at Cool for Cats Podcast. That's a that's a really good way. And since we're starting up, I'm I'm totally open to almost anything. And like I was saying earlier, I have had a ton of feedback. People I don't even know or would have known that are strongly affected by squeeze have contacted me. And some of them are Beatle people. <laughs> so that's, I think, my sort of immediate connection at the moment with people who kind of know me from um, my Beatles connections and conversations. And that's a good thing. That's definitely a good thing that they can transition or have been having, um, you know, a lifelong uh, affliction for squeeze. I'm, I'm totally open to that. So yeah, you can catch me on all those uh, social media platforms. And then when the podcast officially launches, I will uh, be able to go out onto those social media platforms and kind of let everybody know at the moment um, it's not a set date or time so I couldn't tell you, hey, next Thursday, you'll be able to hear me Um, because I'd like to kind of put out maybe a teaser trailer, let everybody know what's happening and then kind of get right to it. Um, Hopefully within the next week or two, like I said, and we had just discussed um, this impetus of people getting back to me so quickly has now uh, pushed me to to get on it and, and put it out there. It seems like everybody's very, very excited. Well, I'm definitely going to push the show for you because, you know, I'm, I know a lot of people who would be in, very interested in in both listening to and potentially taking part in the show as well. Yeah, that's what I'm that's what I'm looking forward to is there's so many fans that um, are not sort of even well known. Um, a lot of the people, a uh, few people that have contacted me are either. Um, have been background people and hopefully they'll be able to sort of point me in directions. Some people have um, seen the band and have been with the band for so many years. A lot of these people now with this age um, and, and sort of history are very easily contactable. I just say what I'm doing, what am I interested in? And they have responded. So I'm really, really happy about that. And like I say, as soon as it comes up, as soon as I can get those ones and zeros in place, um, it the podcast will be out there. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, I will be hosting it, and um, hopefully, we'll have other people on there who would also just be, hey, I'm going to be chatting about it, and I'm just I'm just really excited. I mean, it can go like I said, you know, it's you want to have a structure instead of me just going on and on about my love for a band or or my you know, what my thoughts and, 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 and situations are and how I got to know the band. There's certainly a a bit of that, but I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to having people on now. It seems it's like, whoa. So yeah, definitely. This is all it's, it's as Murray, the K said, it's all happening. (laughs) Another Beatles connection there. Well done. (laughs) Mm. Thank you, Martin. (laughs) That's all right. Anyway, thank you everyone for I was actually before I do the sign out. Just let, let me know when um, when you're going to put the show out for the first time, and I'll I'll make sure that this goes out just prior to it, so it's fresh in people's minds from them listening to this episode, and then they'll be looking for it. That's that's the sort of idea that I was thinking of. Yeah, it's definitely people live in this sort of a age of immediacy and, um, you know, instant gratification. And I'm hoping that's something that I'll be able to supply them with. So most assuredly, this is going to happen. Uh, it's a matter of me, hopefully not staying up uh, 24 hours uh, in a row <laughs> to, <laughs> to make this content happen. Uh, but it is it is happening. It's happening behind the scenes. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to go. It's, it's a go. I, I'm just really, really thrilled. Like I said earlier, that there's, there hasn't been anything of people saying that they don't want this to happen. So that's, that gives you even more of a, a, of a nice feeling inside. Absolutely. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening and I hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us.
Hello. Hi there, Martin. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. That's good. Uh, can you hear me? Am I good? I can with okay. a bit of, um, yeah. It's a bit of a, a bit, delay. Yeah, there was a bit of a bit of a robotic type thing going on there. Okay. Which would have worked better last night when I was talking to the show Robbie the Robot. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How are you? I am fine. Barada, Cluton, Nikto. <laughs> that was my dad's favourite movie. J just for Louise, that's the day the earth stood still. We sat at Simon. Right. Your dad's favourite film. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Probably less embarrassing to admit that than me admitting that my favourite is Singing in the Rain. No, because that's one of my favourites. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. It's brilliant. Yes. Name name an MGM musical. I I'm probably have seen it. Maybe not a hundred times. I've, I, I would, might be familiar enough to, to speak to it. Yep. Yep. Apparently it says on here that your network is a bit slow as well. Yeah, here in Central Florida, for some reason, um, we don't know what has happened. So I wanted to talk to you about that to see yep. if it's still on. The Wi-Fi here in Central Florida is hey. a little bit dodgy for some reason. Of course, it had to be today. <laughs> Well, once let's give it a go. I mean, um, and and see how see how it goes. Cool. Okay, that's good. So, um, yeah. So, so I was I was building you up to the to the show starting. You know, sort of like chat with you and everything. I mean, you've got quite a background, that's for sure. You know, the um, yeah, Boston, Florida, Massachusetts. Yeah, well, Massachusetts that is. Boston, isn't it? But, you know, Florida, Boston, you, you've been all over the States then. Yeah, I was born and brought up in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, spent pretty much most of my life there. Um, then moved to Chicago in the mid-90s and spent uh, roughly 20 years in Chicago. Nice. And then with the family pretty much decided that um, having gone through nearly a lifetime of cold weather and snow, as you can very well sympathize with, yes. decided that uh, Florida uh, was the place to go. So we just uh, were fortunate enough to be able to do that about five years ago with everybody. So that's how we ended up here, literally down the street from Disney World. Wow, that's that's cool. That give, that gives you a nice, uh, you know, day off place to go to. Then I suppose. Yes, it's yeah. it was a very different uh, situation a year ago, as I'm Absolutely. sure it was for almost almost everybody. Yes, um, Life here became this boring. is the. It was it was tumbleweeds. Yes, it was tumbleweeds. Yep. Which it made it made my job so easy though you know because of being a driver at night driving around mm. there was no traffic at all it's the strangest thing going on roads that are normally chock full of traffic and there not being any it was just weird yeah you know, it was very yeah. it was very strange here as well because we are so clogged with traffic um, we live um, sort of. I guess if you want to call it in geographical terms, a little south of Disney. Yep. So everybody would be heading towards Disney on the highway. We live off the highway that kind of sort of takes you into Disney itself. And to be in sort of, like you say, a, a more quiet environment was very, very strange. Very strange. Yep. Yep. So, so there was nothing up the junction. No, it was pretty much, uh, as I mentioned to you previous to this, a lot of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> yes. A bit of argy bargy, as it were. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, down that eight there, you'll be telling me about the East Side story, I'm sure. I can even tell you about the West Side story as well. 
<laughs> oh, there's a musical uh, <laughs> yes. connection. Yep. So um, we'll be going into those as well because I've taken some some notes that I suddenly realised. Um, I, I was I was swatting up and I thought, oh, I remember this. Some bits where I've noticed times when uh, Chris and Glenn have have worked with other people that I've that I'm a fan of as well. So, yeah. so that's let's get, go on. actually one of the yeah. That's one of the great things about these guys is that they they kind of are able to fly under the radar, produce great work for other people that you're not even aware of. So that's yeah. that's the great thing about this about this as well. All right, let's get into this then, shall we? Absolutely. Okay. How was that, Amy? That sounded absolutely fab. Thank you. Well, the Beatles out again there. <laughs> we can never have enough. It's just yeah. we are so intrinsically. It's part of our DNA, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. That's why everybody's excited about the, the even the trailer about the get back thing with the Beatles. Oh my, Martin! Oh my God, Martin! It was just everything in my Twitter feed today. Just all the people that have any connection, including their official account, which I am totally shocked. The official Beatles Twitter account follows me. I don't know who is behind this Twitter account, but anyway, to see it all just one after the other after the other i was like wow another nerve has been hit people were kind of um a little upset that it's going to go six hours but a whole bunch of us also were like only six hours absolutely yeah. <laughs> there's a crazy amount of footage of those sessions it is. And it's, I think what we're running into is two different trains of thought. People are, are just, just bowled over by the quality. And they also knew that Peter Jackson would do justice to the visuals. But the fact that he's kind of almost making a brand new film without having to tread on Mike Lindsay Hogg's original, people are very happy about the look of it. I think there's a lot of trepidation, though, associated with it because nobody wants to see a 180 you know, because it's such a downer, but was it really a downer? And now people are seeing happy, dancing, smiling faces, but do we have to totally erase what happened that month? So it's, it's a very, it, it hits a nerve. That's why, you know, you have people who saw the original. I've seen the original. Um, I know what went on back then. I have a guy, um, his name is, I don't know if you know, Dan Rivkin. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dan runs the Maybe Parted blog, which is basically the entire 30 odd days of, of that of that time period. And he's salivating. So, you know, he wants to see it all. And everybody does. They really do. They want to see this gorgeous looking, you know, piece of film. And 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 they want to see the Beatles, you know, who doesn't, to be honest. As, as a as a side as a side thing, I'm actually chatting with uh, Nick, who does the Winter of Discontent podcast tomorrow afternoon. Oh, oh, excellent, excellent! I mean, you guys are just you're going to have to rein it all in, man, because you can just go off the rails into like 374 different directions just yeah. on that alone, yeah. and it's so hard. It's so hard. I said to Nick, I said, oh, because Nick just contacted me earlier on and said, oh, do you fancy a chat tomorrow? And I said, oh, yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, yes, and now, I said, now. Nah, yes, yeah, because <laughs> because I said to him, I said, we can be we can be really clever with this and get some really good promotion in for Nick by basically issuing the episode of Pods Like Us with Nick in the week leading up to the release of the of the Beatles six hour documentary all about what basically Nick is talking about on his show. Right. And there's just going to be so much content. And I, I really, really have to give the genius stroke to the people at Disney, whoever's doing the programming for this, because you've managed to take this pandemic and what would have been maybe two hours, maybe a little over two hours. Now you're able to grab a, an American audience on Thanksgiving week ish when everybody is home here in the States celebrating with their families. And you're giving us, you're giving us three days of that. And, and everybody's just going bananas. 
it's perfect. They've really picked the right time, especially like you said for the for the American audience. Picking that release schedule is perfect, and doing it six six hours as well. I think that works. But um, I mean, it's going behind the curtain a bit here, pulling the curtain away. I'm actually also recording tomorrow with a few Beatles podcasters where we're actually doing a response to, and it, this shows you the enormity of it all and how people go crazy over it. And it's all mm-hmm. about the response, our reactions to just the trailer. Yeah, I know. It's it's insane. People, uh, you know, it's kind of like how Jason and Stephen always put it. You, you think you know the Beatles, you know, but you don't, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's incredible because they'll say like, you know, don't look behind the curtain, you know, but everybody wants to know what behind the curtain is and, you know, kudos to the sort of relaxation of Apple to, to allow this to happen because you've still got Paul and Ringo and you've got Sean now, who's kind of, I guess, pretty much looking over, John's affairs now and you've got Olivia and I'm sure Danny's going to get involved but all of these people have to look at it and go okay you know this this is this is allowed this is okay yeah you, you'll, you'll actually find that Sean's also in charge of his mother's uh, archive as well because she Yoko Ono there's some re-releases of Yoko stuff coming out as well as archive packages Right. And I just did a book review on um, Hold On World, um, which is written by um, John Kroth. And he did a really nice job talking about Yoko's Plastic Ono Band. So I'm appreciative of the fact that there's like this sort of academia um, sort of hyphen appreciation that can go on. And the fact that, you know, Sean's embracing that and showing us that side of Yoko um, that can continue on is is a good thing. It is a good thing. Besides all the joking and stuff that we have to take with it, you know, which I don't partake in. It's just wasted, wasted breath as far as I'm concerned. But let it be, you know, it can be a can of worms for some people and it can be a revelation for others. And people just say that Jackson's doing his own trilogy, <laughs> but containing it within <laughs> six hours, you know, kudos. <laughs> I'm, I'm not completely what's it with that because so, some of the stuff that i that i saw and heard from the uh, trailer not not all that is in the trailer is completely 100 percent um should we say nice that there are some there's the occasional dig that's that's thrown into the you know verbally so you, that are is in there which shows that I don't think he's going 100% what people thought whitewashing. I think they're actually going to touch on those, maybe not to the degree that some people do, because who, want, who wants to watch six hours of the Beatles arguing and fighting and swearing each other, at each other? But he'll get those little digs in there now and again to, to almost show that these things did happen. Right, and we understand now from this 50-year perspective that even as a human being, being thrown into a cold, dark, cavernous soundstage in January in London could not have been fun. And then to have to perform, so to speak, to have to come up with materials, as a lot of people have said, that they've just only had the White Album released for like six to eight weeks. And now you're having them come in and just crank out new stuff. It's it's mind blowing. It's totally mind blowing. I mean, you know, you, you couldn't ask Chris and Glenn to do something like that. It's just not humanly possible. But okay. they managed to do it. And if they were cranky and grumpy and cold and hungry and snappy, then, then, then we can understand that now. You know, yeah. and and creative people don't work nine to five. <laughs> exactly. You know. Except well, well, no, maybe Paul McCartney does. <laughs> well, no, because even in the, even in those sessions, but when I listen to Nick's show, Winter of Discontent, you'll find that Paul, even though he was well, he was in the heart of London where he lived, Paul would be late very often. Yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't surprise me because I can imagine his impetus was like, well, you know, if nobody else is going to show up on time. Why should I? You know, <laughs> absolutely. Anyway, I'll let you get on now, Amy. That was that was fantastic. Thank you for that. It was lots of fun. Oh yes, 
and I got to let you go get some sleep, sir, because it's like super late where you are. So I understand you've got to, you know, you got to go to, you got to get some rest, you know. I'm a night shift worker, so I'm used to the night time. Uh, I know I had those days myself. So, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for reaching out. And um, yeah, we'll just stay in touch whenever you're ready to, you know, and whenever I'm ready, I'll definitely um, be able to give you more of a uh, definitive date and time. And then, uh, you know, we, we can go from there. Okay. Thank you, Amy. You take care of yourself and I'll, I'll start almost immediately to see if I can get the ball rolling with some things, but, you know, get, get the, get the feelers out there, should we say. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to, you know, like how you've been doing either uh, message me on Facebook or send me an email because this is so hot. I'm really like looking, I feel like I'm looking at everything like with one eye open when I'm even sleeping. So, (laughs) but um, yeah, definitely just stay in touch. And if you need to contact me, you know, we can set up another Zoom thing or whatever you want to do. It's it's totally fine by me. Definitely. Okay, Amy, you take care of yourself. Yes, you too. And say, uh, say good evening to your lovely wife. Hello. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Take care. Thank you very much. You're welcome.